Dr. Taubenberger, how did how did you figure this out that it, that the cause of all of this, what we had called the Spanish lady, the Spanish influenza, was in fact from pigs? The only thing that was known about the influenza virus of uh, 1918 was through indirect evidence in the 1930s. Uh, when the pandemic occurred in 1918, influenza viruses per se were not known to exist, and so there were no viral isolates of, of this specimen. Only in the 1930s, after they had discovered influenza viruses and were able to look at uh, antibody titers in the serum of people who have uh, been infected and recovered from influenza viruses, were they able to have any indirect look at this virus. So 20 years after it occurred, they went back and they looked at the serum titers of people uh -huh. who, um, uh, who were infected but survived, and, and they had titers against influenza viruses, and it was suggested in the 1930s even that their antibodies matched more to swine-type pig influenza viruses than to humans. But other than that, there has been no direct evidence about the virus. Now, you, you and your colleagues come along uh, 30 odd years later, 40 or 50 years later, and what did you do? Well, the, where I work is the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, which is a, a pathology consultation and research institute, uh -huh. and they have been collecting surgical and autopsy pathology specimens uh, for analysis for about the last 100 years, and they had about 70 autopsy cases, uh, all of U.S. servicemen who died uh, of uh, influenza in 1918 in the archives here, and these consist of autopsy tissues that have been um, fixed in formaldehyde and then uh, small pieces of these tissues then embedded in wax and stored. So we were able to uh, actually isolate influenza virus RNA uh, from one of these 80-year-old uh, formal and embedded lung specimens from one soldier who died uh, in 1918. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, amplify out this region and sequence small fragments of the influenza viral genome and then do an analysis of the sequences. And you found that it was not, it didn't uh, originate in Spain and originate in, in swine? Yes, well, the, the name of Spanish influenza uh, is, is a funny kind of misnomer. Uh, it seemed that the, the epidemic uh, arose in the United States in the spring of 1918, and, it originated uh, in the U.S. then? Yes, uh -huh. that's the best evidence. Okay. And it spread um, all over the world, basically affected all populated areas of the world, uh, killing at least 20 million people and maybe up to 40 million people in about a year's time, 1918 to 1919. And I think that this, the spread of the virus was facilitated by the movement of troops and transport ships and so on uh, because of the World War I effort. Right. Um, it was... Uh, quite devastating to the troops on all sides in World War I, but all the combatant countries had controlled press and were not willing to talk about their civilian or military casualties, but Spain as a non-combatant was willing to, to uh, have a lot of press coverage of this terrible epidemic, and so uh, because of that, uh, it, it became known as the Spanish influenza. I see. Huh. That's interesting. The, how, you say it originated in one pig, a swine. Well, um, it, the, the current theory of how influenza viruses, which continually mutate, uh, evolve and uh, appear in humans, is that the natural reservoir for influenza viruses are wild birds, like ducks. Birds. Birds. And that occasionally mutations arise in these bird influenza viruses, which allow them to infect other animals, including some mammals. And pigs, <clears throat> pardon me, seem to be more susceptible to infection of bird type inf avian influenza viruses than are other animals. But and how do you cross the species barrier here to humans? Well, uh, presumably more uh, mutations occur and the, the virus first can adapt itself to life in mammals uh, and then can, can cross from pigs to humans presumably just through uh, respiratory contact. That is, um, pigs with influenza sneezing and uh, passing the virus on to, uh, to humans. But you couldn't get it from your Sunday morning sausages? or No, no, no. We're talking about live animals right. who, who get infected. Uh, pigs can get influenza symptoms basically like humans, and there are influenza outbreaks in pigs. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say, of course, Doctor, when you mentioned swine flu, we jump ahead to the mid-'70s when there yes. was a big scare yes. in the U.S. And, and indeed uh, in Canada and pretty well everywhere about swine flu which turned out not to be that big a deal anyway. Yes, well, it's really uh, quite um, a remarkable story. Uh, the, as I said, the indirect evidence suggested that, that this virus from 1918 was a swine-type influenza virus, and 
win in 1976. Some soldiers in uh, New Jersey, in Fort uh, Dix, in Fort Dix yeah. were uh, that's correct. Were were infected with this virus, and then when the virus was isolated and characterized, it turned out to be a swine flu virus of the predicted subtype of the 1918 flu. And so a lot of people were uh, were very scared that this was a reappearance of the 1918 epidemic, and that led to this enormous uh, effort to vaccinate the population. For whatever reason, that virus turned out not to be very virulent and turned out not to spread. Mm-hmm. And one of the goals of our work is to characterize the genetic basis of this most deadly influenza virus to try to understand if there is a correlation between the gene structure of this strain and its virulence. And could that be used in the future to help predict when new and deadly influenza strains would arise?